Hi, Lilius. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, I got the right person, I see. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming on early. Yeah, no problem. All right, let me just try sharing my screen here and see if it's okay. going to work. Oh, you have disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, let me see. All right, try that. Okay. Yep, there's that. Okay, it looks like we got it. Nice. Let me see. All right. Okay, good. That only took a minute. I was afraid there'd be. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's you better know, to be. Safe and sorry. Yeah, you just never know. Yeah. So are you keeping busy? Oh, yeah. Very busy. Mainly doing organizing or mainly doing other things? Um, both. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no wonder you're busy then. Yeah. <laughs> Where mostly are you organizing? It just the are you, have you got like the whole estate or do, is it West River? Or? Yeah, mostly focusing on West River, but also I'm um, doing candidate recruitment with the whole state. Oh wow! Right, how much candidate recruitment are you going doing so far? Um, we're just now starting. We have a committee. Mm -hmm. Well, I hope you have some luck, uh, West River. It's so hard to win that it's hard to get I people. Know. Yeah, it's tough. I guess District 32 in Rapid City is one of the better districts, the best one in Pennington County anyway. Yeah, it's one of the biggest. Or most populated. Yeah, I don't know exactly where it is, though. Do you off the top of your head? Mm, I think it's kind of more um, towards the valley and kind of um, towards the east side of Rapid City. Okay. I think we're District 34, right? I'm District 33. Oh, 33, yeah. That's more yeah. on the west side. It, it's, uh, it's not actually the west side. It's actually just a west corner and then goes out into the hills and then goes up to Somerset and Blackhawk yeah and then part of North Rapid and then a slice out to Box Elder it's crazy yeah busy. it's crazy how much gerrymandering it is yeah there is a lot there is a lot yeah hello Lexi Ramey Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, how are you? Good, good. How are you, Remy? I'm doing well, thank you. Just finished up dinner. Oh, oh nice. So he's nice and happy. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to catch you before dinner. No, uh -uh. and then I was sitting in the sun, so I almost went to sleep. Gee. Oh. Yeah. Acting like a uncle. Uncle Grandpa <laughs> <laughs> taking a nap in the sun. Well, I'm mainly going to have a PowerPoint and then do questions just so you kind of know what to expect. There's so much visual stuff with mining that I always do a PowerPoint if I can. Yeah, yeah, that sounds good.
Is there anything else you want to um, focus on, Lilius? Um, no, I'm mainly going to focus on uh, uranium mining and then gold mining and then uh, questions. OK. I think uh, I have a lot, plenty of time for questions, so. OK. Uh, Rami and I will probably just take turns, you know, um, conversating with you. OK. Are you going to be on the entire time, Rami? Yeah, I'll be here. Okay, um, I'm because I was gonna go to Inipi at six, so I might um dip out early, if you want to finish up for me, or take over kind of towards the end. Oh huh. Oh huh. Pilamaya ye. Oh. There she is. Hi, good evening, Amaron. Good evening, how are you? I'm good, how are you doing? It's good to see you almost live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, how exciting. I'm always interested in seeing what the questions are at the end of this presentation. Oh yeah. People come up with some really good ones. Hey, did you, um, were you going to do slide? Like yes, a slide we, we tested it. Oh, good. And I tested it to make sure it's going to work. Awesome. I'm going to do a fair number of slides because so much of the information is visual. And then I'll click out of that. And then there should be plenty of time for questions still. So. OK, that sounds good. Ramey on. And then I have I'm I'm at um Callan's office too, so he's here too. Hello. Okay. Hi Callan. <laughs> We're working, Ramey, we're working on the um, that the letter. We got everyone's input, and so we're implementing it into a letter. 100 miles an hour. He's going 100 miles an hour, he said. That's good. So we'll share it when he's done. I usually wait till five to let everyone in. So kind of gives us a chance to prepare. Yeah. I think I'm ready. Okay. I'm always ready. Yeah. I was calculating one time a few years ago and I've I've given somewhat over probably 170 presentations on uranium mining. Oh, really? Yeah. So I gave a lot when I lived in Colorado because we beat a project there. So. Oh, nice. Uh, PowerTech wanted to mine there and people changed the state laws and kicked them out. That's good.
I told Ramey he has to brush his hair and fix it if he's going to get on video. Tell him to brush his teeth too. I know. I don't know <laughs> if he is though. We'll see. What he... <laughs> he was all. Oh, look, he is brushing his hair. I <laughs> 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 got after him. Crazy guy. Mm -hmm. Um, did you hear me? Oh no, I don't think you're on Elena, but we're Al Kellen and I implemented everyone's um responses mm -hmm. to the to the letter, and so he's finishing it up right now. Oh, awesome. And then we took a we took a little excerpt out of there and then we put it on a social media graphic. And I made a really cool graphic with like a, a judge with a so um good. feather so and the, I'll have to show it to you. But we're almost done with this, so we're excited to share it with you guys. Yeah outstanding yeah we did it yesterday <laughs> the <Nice>. graphic <laughs> it was fun but it was hard because all of like i took it from all of the canva elements you know and there was no colored judges or <laughs> women judges <laughs> so i had to make my own <laughs> oh yeah and then Callan, he was really like can you oh, put clip art a medicine wheel in there as if they just have medicine wheels <laughs> So I had to create a medicine wheel. And, yeah, I said Canva needs to be indigenized. It really does. You know, with um, I went to a, a newspaper convention one time, and they always oh, there's vendors there, and there was this vendor from Texas, and he was trying to get me to buy into his advertisement stuff to where it's it's just kind of like Canva images, graphics, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so I asked him, like, one of the problems we had at the time with the services we were using was that it wasn't diverse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that was one of the things I brought up to him, like, look, this, this is my readership demographic, and this is what I would need. Yeah. And he straight up said, you know, I don't think this would be a good fit. <laughs> <laughs> like, no. oh. We, we well, really need to. So at I least he was honest. That. Yeah. Yeah, we need an indigenous Canva. <laughs> Maybe I'll create one. That would be awesome. All right, I think I'm going to start letting everyone in. There's four people waiting, so. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Hello, Rebecca. Hello, Sherilyn. Hello, Mary. Hey, Tante. Hi, Dennis. We'll just wait a few minutes for people to join. Good evening, JP. I like Hello your logo. There. I like your logo you have. Thank you. Did you create that yourself? No, actually, it uh, was created for the Sioux Falls Pride. Mm. And uh, so I kind of am starting to adopt it to work with the, uh, the party now as the new chairman of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual questioning and two spirit caucus. Nice. That's awesome. So we'll see if people accept it, but yeah, it, it covers everybody. So I think we're doing good. I like it. They let me steal it. So what the heck? Yeah. <laughs> That's nice of them. I like that. 
Good evening, everyone. Well, I guess we will just go ahead and get started. Uh, let's see here. Lexi, Ramey, you want to start us off with the prayer as usual? I'm going to talk to you up, you know. Hey, I'll help you. Wash day. Hey, Iche, to Kashala and Petu Kile, me chante ki me chuyaskaye. Hey, Che, toha ni toka, wayasu kiel, wahi najiki, imaya kukta. To Kashala, we chuni me tawa kiel, and Petu wanji ake me ku. He on wopi la i chichi e, mi chante ki i chia tan ha, ha hechetu, mitaku e oyasi. Hmm, mitaku e oyasi, pilamaya e. Thank you, Remy, for always starting us off right. So good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Chante Hart, and I am the Native Outreach and West River Field Director for the South Dakota Democratic Party. And I just want to welcome all of you. And I'm really grateful for all of you for joining us this evening. We have a special guest with us, Lilius, Dr. Lilius Jarding from the Black Hills Clean Water Alliance. And um, I am really excited to hear what Lilius has to, has to tell us this evening. Um, first, I would like to introduce our staff members and caucus members. Um, I would like to introduce Elena, beautiful bald eagle. Would you, would you like to give a welcome and introduce yourself? Thank you, Chante. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elena, beautiful bald eagle. I am a member of the Ocheti Shakome caucus, and I help the Democratic Party with public relations in regards to Native American Indigenous issues. Welcome, and I am excited to hear from Dr. Jarding tonight. Thank you. And she is also the wife of our next person we're going to introduce, Ramey Bald Eagle. Hamoitakiapi. My name is Ramey William Beautiful Bald Eagle Sr., and I am the husband of the talented Elena Beautiful Bald Eagle. Uh, I, it's my pleasure to assist the uh, Ocheti Shakoni Caucus uh, for this Omnichie. Pilamayel. We also have our vice president of the caucus here, Callan Returns from Scout. Good evening, everyone. We, um, my name is Callan Returns from Scout. Um, I'm, I'm born and raised in Rapid City, South Dakota. I am a tribal citizen of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe. Uh, I am also a lifelong Democrat. Um, I have done numerous uh, community organizing events, but particularly um, right now throughout my years, I've worked for the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Association for the past three years, um, where I serve as our finance officer among other tasks. And right now we are working on some uh, issues uh, outside of this, uh, outside of our caucus and um, and so I'm going to be here in person but uh, not going to be in front of the screen so I hope that we have a great discussion I thank everybody for coming here and um, partaking in this uh, wonderful concept that Elena has um, uh, kind of taken to her um, to facilitate and organize and it's important because it brings all of us together and that's important um, for the work I think that all of us are doing um, to be impactful so have a, a good discussion and um, I'll look forward to the questions after. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys. So um, at this time, I would like to introduce Lilius Jones Jarding. She is a researcher and an activist who has worked in coalitions to successfully oppose uh, unwise nuclear and energy related projects in the upper Midwest and mountains since 1979. Uh, currently, she works as a coordinator for Black Hills Clean Water Alliance, ev evaluation director for Thunder Valley CDC, and a faculty member at Oglala Lakota College. She has a PhD in political science with an emphasis on environmental policy from Colorado State. She also has a master's in public and human service 
administration from Minnesota State University in Warhead. And she's received a number of awards and scholarships for her community service. We're really grateful for everything she does in the community, creating awareness on um, protecting our, our water and our resources. So at this time, I would like to hand it over to Lilius Jarding. Thank you, Lilius, for being with us tonight. Thank you, Chante, and thank you to the Ochete Shakoli Caucus for inviting me to talk tonight. I should update that uh, introduction just a little bit because um, I still teach an occasional class at uh, OLC, uh, but I no longer work at Thunder Valley. I retired 11 days before COVID hit, so um, I have been having a strange retirement or a semi-retirement is more like it. But what I would like to uh, talk about tonight is um, I want to talk some background and some current information on uranium mining in the Black Hills. And then I want to do the same thing for gold projects in the Black Hills. And then I will, I've left plenty of time for questions. Um, I use slides, uh, and I use, I'm going to use them a lot tonight. So you will have visuals because mining is a visual issue among other things. And, um, and it also allows you a um, little bit of help in terms of if you want to take a couple of notes or comments or think of questions, those kinds of things. So thank you all for being here. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. So I'm specifically talking about opposing mining in the Black Hills. I'm not talking about it as just a general topic. Uh, because I oppose mining in the Black Hills and have worked off and on to do that for some years, as Chante mentioned. Well, let's see, there we go. So this is just a quick overview. Uranium mining in the Black Hills will be the first topic. Gold mining in the Black Hills will be the second topic. And what you can do about these issues would be the third topic. trying to get it to shift and it's not shifting very well. There we go. So first we'll talk about uranium mining. Uranium is used for nuclear weapons and for nuclear power. Um, it is both radioactive and toxic. Um, radioactivity, as many of you I'm sure are quite aware, is basically forever. Uh, when uranium is exposed, uh, it breaks down into a series of uh, elements and ends up being a non-radioactive version of lead in about 4.5 billion years. Uranium has unique risks, partly because of the radioactivity and partly because it is also toxic. Uh, the main things that one would see with exposure to uranium would be cancer or kidney problems. Historically, there was uranium mining in the Black Hills from 1951 to 1972. Uh, this picture is from the Southwest, but it gives you an idea of what uranium activities were like at the time. The public was unaware of the da dangers. Um, there was no state regulation in South Dakota. Um, as a result, the Cheyenne River is still contaminated, and there are 169 unreclaimed abandoned mines and prospects in the Southern Black Hills. There was a uranium rush in the 1970s um, with about two dozen companies. In, the, in 1979, the organization that formed to oppose this was called the Black Hills Alliance. And it was sort of an unlikely alliance. Um, I worked for the organization, that's how I ended up in Rapid City. And uh, we had everything from NRA gun instructors to old hippies who were afraid of fluorescent lights. So it was a very broad alliance. Um, the 1980 survival gathering, which took place just northeast of Rapid City, brought 11,000 people to the Black Hills to camp uh, for as much as 10 days and to discuss issues of survival in the future. Uh, we had good lawyers, the price of uranium dropped, and the companies left without there being any new mining. This is a picture of a walk we did. 
More recently, starting in about 2006, there have been 11 uranium companies who expressed an interest in the Black Hills or had claims here. Um, that is, and that's mineral claims. I'll talk more about mining claims in a bit. Uh, as of early this year, there are only now three companies that are interested in uh, uranium mining in the Black Hills. One of them has opened a mine near Mato Tipila, um, and it does in situ leaching, which I'll describe in just a moment. So this is the picture of in situ leach uranium mining. Um, this kind of mining occurs underground. Um, it involves poking wells underground into the aquifer where the uranium is found. And this kind of mining can only be done when the uranium ore is in a groundwater aquifer. So what happens is uh, there are sometimes thousands of wells drilled. The uh, extraction solution, which is water and a base usually, and oxygen is pumped underground through the wells. It goes through the uranium ore and picks it up. And then it is pumped back to the surface with the uranium and the uranium is then pulled out and processed. So this is a real simplified version of kind of how it works. So you got a little bit of a picture in your mind of what, what we're talking about. In situ leach mining um, has a number of types of water contamination that are associated with it. There are wastewater ponds, which can uh, water can slosh out of them in a flood situation. Uh, the liners can break and there can be um, wastewater sinking into the ground. <clears throat> the underground mining solution can move either laterally, either horizontally or vertically out of the mining area due to various factors. And when that happens, it's called an excursion. Uh, everything is under a high level of pressure and there's a lot of piping and pumps. So if one of those fails, you will end up with a, a potentially with a spill of contaminated fluids. Um, these spills can happen above ground or below ground. And in situ leach uranium mines co typically commonly have dozens of what are called reportable incidents. And these may be an excursion, these may be a wastewater pond break, they can be all sorts of things. But there are, I think at the Crow Butte uranium mine down by Crawford in Northwestern Nebraska, there were about 75 reportable incidents the last time I looked and that mine is currently closing down. The other thing is that once they stop putting pressure on everything and, and they leave the mine, um, the water underground still moves through the aquifer where the uranium was found and it can still be full of toxins and can still move out of the mining area. So those are some of the common types of water contamination. The um, uranium project that our organization deals with is in the southwestern edge of the Black Hills. The company is Azarga Uranium and its subsidiary is PowerTech. It operates as PowerTech in South Dakota. It's called the Dewey Burdock Project from two very small towns. Well, Dewey is a very small town and Burdock, I guess, does not really exist anymore. Um, it's right along the railroad tracks north of Edgemont. It is a company that has uh, organized in Canada. Its chairman here uh, lives in China and some of its uh, beneficiaries would include Russia. It's a project that's over 12,000 acres in size. And as I said, it's, in, it's on the southwestern edge of the Black Hills. It's in Custer and Fall River counties. Uh, let's see, I guess you can see most of the edge of this. Um, this is a picture of what it looks like when they're digging or drilling an in situ leach uranium mine. And PowerTech wants to drill 4,000 mining wells into, uh, as geologists say it, the Indian Kara Aquifer. Uh, this would destroy cultural resources. 
they want to pump just over 9,000 gallons per minute of water, which is 40% more water than Rapid City gets from it well, its wells. And then when mining is done, they want to pump their wastes into another aquifer, the Minnelusa aquifer. Uh, both the Indian Kara aquifer and the Minnelusa aquifer are used by people for drinking water in some areas, uh, Indian Kara quite locally. So they have to shut off wells in order to be able to do this, shut off drinking water wells and agricultural wells. This is the company's office in Edgemont. They need about 10 permits. It's um, a little hard to tell because we don't know what Custer County will require, but they um, are trying right now to get permits from the Federal Environmental Protection Agency, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Bureau of Land Management. They also have applied for four permits from the State Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources. So I'm not going to go in great detail on any of these because it's it's gotten to be extremely complex and there are lots of levels of government and agencies involved, but I'm going to talk a bit about a couple of the major ones. The first is the Environmental Protection Agency, federal agency. It issued uh, draft water permits to the company in March of 2017. And these are permits for mining and a permit for pumping wastewater underground, as well as a declaration that the area would never be used for drinking water again, an exemption they call that. And hearings were held in April and May of uh, 2017. About 700 people attended those hearings and 92% of their comments were against mining, against the mining. So there's a clear consensus among most people against this project. They then, the EPA put out new draft permits and held a hearing in October of 2019. And there was just verbal comments and 100% of them were against the mining. Nonetheless, the EPA issued the permits in last November and the Oglala Sioux Tribe has appealed those permits. Okay. So they're currently in a state of suspension. The company can't use them at this point or anything. The other major agency is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, which governs nuclear power plants and nuclear materials. Uh, PowerTech filed an application with them in 2009. They were originally planning to start mining in 2009. They haven't started yet. So the, the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission's process is really um, complex and doesn't make sense to people who aren't really versed in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's processes. But um, basically, the Oglala Sioux Tribe objected to the cultural site survey process for the uranium project. Um, the survey process was not done in an appropriate manner. And their goal, of course, is to protect cultural and historical resources. So despite that and other objections, the uh, board of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission issued the company a license in April of 2014. Then later in August of 2014, then they held a hearing on the license. So they issued the license and then they held a hearing on whether to issue the license. The Oglala Sioux Tribe appealed the license. The um, court, the federal court, told the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to do a proper cultural survey. Uh, there was a long process. And the um, uh, next major thing that happened was the NRC decided against the tribe in 2020. And the OST, the Oglala Sioux Tribe, has appealed to federal court again. So this license is also in a state of suspension. And this picture is from parades. We do parades. If you like, to, like parades, we do parades. So you can come join us one day. Now, the state 
process I'm just going to cover real quickly. Powertech needs three state water permits and one state mining permit. The uh, mining permits are on hold since 2013. Um, the water permits are being are a concern of the Water Management Board. And in 2013, we had a, a week and a half of hearings on the water permits here in Rapid City. And the uh, company and the Water Management Board decided to put that hearing process on hold. So in 2013, the process was put on hold until the company gets all of its federal permits. As I indicated, the federal permits are on hold still. The company can't use them. But the board, the Water Management Board, said that Power Tech can ask to restart the permitting process just last week. So um, the state is moving forward, even though the federal permits are in court and could get overturned. So that's the current state of that process. And that is, um, as I said, kind of complex, but um, I'm sure you got the basics of it and we'll have some questions. But first I'm gonna talk a bit about gold mining in the Black Hills. And this is something that more people know something about. Um, gold mining started in the Black Hills in the 1870s, at which time the Black Hills were taken from Lakota control. In the process, of course, treaties were violated and non-Indian miners poured into the area. The gold industry has brought a history of destruction of land and water, and the profits for the most part have gone out of the area to investors around the world. A key piece of the legislation in this whole thing, both uranium and gold, is the 1872 mining law. Um, it was, signed by President Grant in 1872, so most people consider it quite outdated, but it was designed to promote mining and to encourage non-Indians to move into the West. The basic process is that anyone can stake a claim, and there are two pictures here of ways that people can stake a mining claim. Once they have staked a mining claim and recorded it, they have the absolute right to explore for minerals. And if they find minerals, they have the absolute right to mine. This is on federal controlled mining claims. So the Bureau of Land Management manages them. Uh, they're not all under federal land, although the Forest Service, there are a lot of claims, which we'll talk about more in a minute. But if there is a situation where they file a federal claim and they want to explore or mine and there is a private person who owns the surface of the land, they literally only own the surface of the land. And if a mining company comes along and stakes a claim and wants to mine, the surface owner has to move away. Okay. And there are also under this law are no federal royalties. So the the uh, mining companies don't pay anything to the federal government. So many of you are familiar with some of the problems in the Black Hills, the Homestake Mine and Lead contaminated soil, surface water, groundwater, killed 18 miles of a creek and was a Superfund site and left a large hole, which is called the open cut. Many of you have probably been to Lead and seen the open cut. Uh, the city of Lead, uh, it tries to make it a tourist attraction, but the reality is that it is an unreclaimed mine. The other place we've had a Superfund site as a result of gold mining in the Black Hills is the Gilt Edge Mine, also in the Northern Hills. Um, it stopped operation in 1999, and the state and the EPA have been working ever since to stop water from leaking out of the mine that is acidic. So this acid mine drainage, as it's called, is a problem in a lot of old mines, particularly gold mines and I believe copper mines at the other place, it's a real problem. The wastes from this mine are currently being drilled by a company called Agnico Eagle, which hopes to find enough gold to reopen the mine. 
couple of recent accidents, just because what happens at this point is that mining company people will say, well, that's that was then, this is now, we have great new technology and everything will be fine this time. But only a few years ago in 2015 in the Gold King mine in Colorado, there was a spill of this acid mine drainage that I was talking about. This is a picture of it, and that is the actual color of the river where the spill happened. The impacts were felt for 150 miles. So essentially it would be the equivalent of the Black Hills almost to Pier, almost to the Missouri River. There is some contamination in the Missouri River as the result of historic gold mining in the Black Hills. Another example is uh, Bruma Dinho mine in Brazil in 2019. There was a dam that was holding back mining waste rock and it broke. 134 people were killed and 252 were unaccounted for. So what is the situation now? Uh, first thing to recognize is that the price of gold is high. That's part of why we're seeing what we're seeing in the Black Hills. And in the central Black Hills, this is six applications to explore uh, lands controlled by the Forest Service. That's just in the central Black Hills. We asked the Forest Service in a Freedom of Information Act request about those applications and tried to get copies of them. It took them uh, over a year to tell us who the companies were that were involved or who the individuals were that were involved in some cases or where these, uh, act, these projects were. To the north, uh, most of you probably have heard of the Wharf mine, which is a gold and silver mine. They've actually been mining more silver than gold recently. Um, they are a large open pit mine south of Deadwood. They want to expand further, and they use about 1.8 million gallons of water per day. There are also two projects where people want to explore between Custer and Jewel Cave. In the far northwestern part of the Black Hills, but within South Dakota is the Dakota Territory Project. Then we are seeing the impacts of the uh, renewable energy technology revolution that has been happening in the United States. And we're starting to see also the impacts on the local area of electric vehicles. And these are a project that's called Rare Earths Mining, which is north of Sundance, Wyoming. That project started up and is on hold and is trying to start up again. And I'm, I'm not gonna get into rare earth in any detail, but they are necessary for things like wind turbines and cell phones and so forth. And this is uranium and rare earths are both considered critical minerals under a new policy that came about towards the end of the Trump administration that is still in place. And this is about minerals that are critical to the so-called green revolution um, that also would be involved with mining. They would need to be mined before they were used. This is just a picture of the wharf mine, so you can kind of get a picture of what it looks like. So the impacts of gold mining are cultural resources and rural life are threatened by both ex exploration and mining and by 24 hour noise, light and traffic. This starts at the exploration phase. They use cyanide to leach the gold out of the rock so there can be cyanide spills. Wildlife of course is displaced. Uh, many mines, as I mentioned, like the Gilt Edge Superfund site, have permanent acid water drainage. They don't know how to stop it because it, it involves having hit groundwater. And then mining waste rock is stored with water behind a dam. And that is the accident I mentioned where people were killed was because the dam broke in a mining waste rock situation. We have a... a waste dam in the Northern Black Hills that's from Homestake and it's left over and it's called the Grizzly Gulch Mine Waste Rock Site. 
So Rapid Creek watershed, which I'll show you a map of in a moment, is the center of the gold projects that are of the most concern uh, to me, to our organization, and uh, to, to people in Rapid City for sure. Because Rapid Creek feeds all below ground water and all above ground water sources for Rapid City. So if there is gold activity, well, there is a little bit now, but if, if there is gold activity in the watershed for Rapid Creek, all everything that's on the ground washes into the creek and can end up in Rapid City's water supply. If there was a toxic spill in the central Black Hills, it would go into or could go into Rapid Creek, which goes into Pactola Lake, and Pactola Lake is Rapid City's water supply. From Rochford, where one of these projects is happening, to Lake Pactola, though um, we had a school of mines graduate calculate, it would take about 29 to 36 minutes for a spill by Rochford to get down to Lake Pactola and Rapid City's water supply. That's the project that's farther away from Lake Pactola of the two I'm gonna be talking about. So this is a picture of the um, Rapid Creek watershed. The sort of blue round area is all the area that is drained into Rapid Creek and therefore into Rapid City's water supply. And there is a project going on called Rapid Creek Watershed Action, and I'll give you the website when we get towards the end, which is working to designate this area as a recreation area through a congressional act. And um, uh, Sheridan Lake is a recreation area under congressional act. Pactola and Deerfield reservoirs are not. And protections of them could be removed by the Forest Service. So as a result of our Freedom of Information Act request that I mentioned, we discovered some things, and these are some of the more important ones in my mind. One is that the Forest Service has a pattern of blocking, uh, giving information to the public. That's why we filed the Freedom of Information Act request in the first place. And it is now involved in a lawsuit that we filed against the Forest Service. We found out that there's some fear mongering by a School of Mines instructor regarding our activities. We discovered that the Forest Service singles out native people who oppose these projects. Uh, we discovered that Forest Service law enforcement is involved with dealing with meetings that the public attends and things like that. Um, we discovered additional exploration projects, which I've already mentioned. And um, the law enforcement frames what they call protesting groups to include both tribal and clean water activities. So we're given the title of being protesting when we're not protesting anything. We're doing public education and we're stating our opinions. So there are two large gold exploration projects in the Black Hills, in the central Black Hills right now. One is Mineral Mountain Resources, which is a Canadian company. This is a picture of some of their equipment moving into the hills and a picture of one of their drill sites. They have 7,500 acres of claims near Peshla and Rochford. They want an open pit mine. They have been drilling um, off and on for a couple of years now, east of Rochford on land where they have a state permit that is privately controlled by the mining company. Um, and they are doing an environmental assessment, the Forest Service is doing an environmental assessment for the Forest Service controlled lands. Um, but that is um, still in the early stages. The other major project in the Central Black Hills is by F3 Gold. Sometimes they use the name Big Rock Exploration. They're out of Minnesota. They have over 2,500 mining claims in the Central Black Hills. So in the area I showed you on the map of Rapid Creek Watershed, 24% of that entire area is under claims, mining claims by just two gold companies. 
That's the extent of what we're talking about. 24% of the entire Central Black Hills under claims by mining companies. F3 has asked to drill near the inlet to Pactola Lake, so right where Rapid Creek comes into Pactola Lake. Uh, a big part of their proposed drill site is a bighorn sheep birthing area. Um, the Forest Service, state and federal governments have spent a lot of time, time, time trying to um, rebuild the bighorn sheep herds in the Black Hills. And the process of considering this project is on hold during COVID due to the need to do tribal consultation, which is a federal requirement. And um, tribal consultation has not been able to happen because tribal offices are closed and people are unavailable due to uh, COVID. So F3 Gold does have a state exploration permit. They have filed for their Forest Service exploration permit. The Forest Service is working on, again, an environmental assessment, which is just part of the process. And we expect this environmental assessment to happen soon, as soon as tribal consultation is finished. Um, and at that time, we're going to need comments made, written comments, and perhaps um, public comments given orally to by tribal public and organization uh, and individuals and we probably will need that soon so um, if you want to receive emails from us about this you can put assuming the chat is working you could put your name and email address in the chat and i'll pick those up so all this gets terribly depressing right they're they're really set up to do some really horrible things to the black hills um, and so I have a long list of things that you can do. There are ways to stop this. I've been involved in stopping uranium mining in Colorado and in the Black Hills historically. Um, you know, there, there are a number of projects, mining projects that are getting stopped these days. So one thing to do is to find out more and I'll give you our website address in a bit. Um, on the website, you'll find a petition to the EPA related to the uh, uranium project that we want people to sign and spread around. We're um, working on a thousand signatures at this point and getting close to that. When there are opportunities to do written and oral comments, you can make write comments or give comments. We ask that any organization that anybody belongs to um, and any group that is identifiable pass a resolution against the mining. And so that's what it means by pass resolutions. Um, the uh, South Dakota Democratic Party has in its platform um, language that discourages these mining projects. I don't remember the exact wording. Um, join our listserv if you want to be on our email list. Like I said, you can put your name and email address in the chat. Um, you can host presentations. Again, any group or people that are getting together that you want. I can do a presentation from anywhere from 15 minutes to hours, but nobody's ever asked for one of those. So, <laughs> um, And I have a projector and will travel. And uh, all I ask is that if people can help with gas or if they can feed me, um, that would be great. And it's not always me giving the presentation, but usually. And the person in the picture is Carla Marshall, who is our co-coordinator for Black Hills Clean Water Alliance. She and I have worked together for a long time. But she wanted to tell Smokey a thing or two, so. Um, our monthly meetings are Zoom currently, so anybody can attend. Um, the Rapid Creek Watershed Action Project that I mentioned, here is the uh, URL for that project. The other things you can do are talk to everyone, people that in your family, people that are your friends, people in groups you belong to, talk to them about this because it's amazing to me, but I'm still finding people in Rapid City who don't know that their water is directly threatened by gold projects. Uh, so we can't reach everybody. We need your help. Um, if you live in Rapid City area uh, and want to come with us to hold signs, we have what's showing here is some lighted signs that we use when it's dark. 
and and we also have banners and we just stand on street corners and wave to people and they honk to us and and um wave to us and all kinds of stuff so it's fun to do it doesn't take long it doesn't take a lot of people but we do it pretty regularly um you can certainly donate and our website will be up in a minute and then we need your help <laughs> you know the more people get involved in this uh, the better it is and the more likely we are able to stop these projects. So for a quick summary, there's a large uranium project working to get permits to mine along the southwest rim of the Black Hills. There are also a number of gold projects, including <coughs> excuse me, the wharf mine, two large exploration projects in Rapid Creek watershed and smaller projects. And you can help stop these mines and protect the water and landscapes of the Black Hills. So with that, I'll put up our website and our uh, Facebook link and ask for your questions. Also, you can become a member, is that right, of Black Hills Clean Water Alliance? A member, our definition of member is anyone who agrees with our goals and is moving in the same direction. We don't have paid memberships. Oh, okay, awesome. And um, yeah, I, I helped um, hold signs up one one yep. week a few times so that's pretty fun too they have some cool light up signs and they'll go meet at a special place and you can stand there and you get a lot of honks and it's a good way to create awareness but i think everyone in rapid city should know about this and be aware that our 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 water is under attack yep. so thank you lilius we really appreciate everything it was a lot of um useful information uh, we do have a question from sharon schultz um, she asked, does the federally required tribal consultation process you mentioned give tribes veto power over proposed mining operations? Uh, where there is the 1872 mining law, the um, consultation is, like I said, required. But if the tribes say, just say no, um, it doesn't stop the project. There have to be legal avenues used to stop projects. Mm. or else enough public um, outrage that the company goes away. Um, Ramey, you have a question? <clears throat> Actually, I have a few and a <laughs> lot of comments, but I want to start by saying, uh, Dr. Johnny, thank you for being here tonight. I really enjoyed what you have to present. Um, it's always good uh, when I see you, uh, I, see, I see an ally. Uh, when I was uh, when I'm representing a tribe in Pierre, it's always good to see you and the folks from the, um, the Clean Water Alliance. And um, so I have a couple of questions. One, is there a is there a do you have a I, I'm trying to make it easy for for me. So uh, do you have a uh, some resolution language template or something like that that I can beg our Ocheti Shakoe caucus? to um, uh, put on the agenda for our next meeting so that so that we as the Ocheti Shakui can come out with some strong language and oppose this kind of thing. Uh, and then and then the second question I have is uh, there I've, I've heard some talk. I'm not going to say anything's concrete or anything's moving, but I've heard some talk about uh, tribal governments considering um, uh, using the Indian Self-Determination Act, and um, reaching out and actually contracting the National Forest Service and and uh, and all of those federal agencies in the Black Hills uh, from the federal government to uh, to help the tribes have a bigger say in what happens there, especially when it comes to mining and and hunting. And then third, thirdly, um, is um, is what is stopping organizations like the Clean Water Alliance or or tribal governments from uh, going out and getting as many of these mining permits as possible as sort of placeholders or as as uh, chips or or bargaining chips or or just to to keep anybody else from doing that. So okay. thank you. Good questions, Remy. Thank you. Um, I will get some resolution language to you by email. If anybody else wants it, and hopefully your email's in the chat, and we won't shut down the chat right away, hopefully, so I can collect those. 
um, but we have a number of examples. The city of Rapid City passed a resolution against uh, gold exploration or mining in the Rapid Creek watershed. So um, that's one that I have, but I have some others and I'll get them to you. Um, in terms of tribal rural contracting, I haven't heard anything about that. So you might wanna talk to other people you know um, about that. I know you know everybody, so. <laughs> and then uh, your third question was about uh, doing claims. Um, that's an idea that comes up regularly. There are a few places I've heard of where it's been tried. Um, the problem is by the time we think about doing something like that, the mining companies have claimed, uh, you know, 24% of the Rapid Creek watershed. And that includes the lands that they want to work on and including mining potentially. So um, we're behind the curve. So that's one issue. Second issue is that it costs money to stake a claim and file a claim. It's, it's not a whole lot of money per claim, but if you're talking a bunch, it will get expensive in a hurry. And the third thing is that to keep the claim, you have to pay a fee each year and you have to prove that you are working the land, that you're doing something that might lead towards mining. So I've known people who've owned a couple claims and they go out with a rent a, a some kind of large equipment once a year and that fulfills that requirement. But if we were talking a lot of land, there would have to be a lot of destruction done, frankly, <laughs> to um, keep those claims. So those are the reasons that that has not been a big uh, task that we've taken on. Did I get your questions all right? Yes, yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ramey. Um, yeah, if you want to email me, Lilius, any templates you might have that we could use. Okay. Um, the caucus definitely wants to uh, pass a resolution to, to help you. Okay. Uh, um, next, Great. Elena. Thank you, Chante. Um, I just wanted to add something. Um, I've got quite a few quite a few thoughts going on in my, my mind right now. Um, you know, uranium and the topic of uranium mining, it, it hits really close to home for me. Um, I don't know if you guys know the history of uranium mining uh, on my reservation back home in the Southwest. I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation and we have a really tragic and horrific history with uranium mining. Um, you know, back under the United States Manhattan Project, uranium mining um, was done on our reservation in Arizona. And thousands of Navajo men were employed as uranium miners. And the United States Atomic Energy Commission failed to inform Navajo workers of the dangers of mining. And they really failed to regulate the industry. And as a result, we are still dealing with open uranium mines with an estimated, well, there's over an estimated 500 um, abandoned mines that we are still trying to clean up to this day. And back in 1979, um, we had a, a spill that devastated a great portion of our reservation and it contaminated our rivers. Um, and it was, it's considered one of the worst radioactive spills to have happened in the United States. And we are still dealing with that. Um, we are traditionally farmers. And um, when the water sources were contaminated, the, uh, our tribal government asked the New Mexico governor for help um, when the spill happened and the governor refused and there was no aid sent to our tribe. Um, and there was just hundreds of cases of uranium related illnesses. And this was back in the 70s and we are still feeling that effect today. The rates of cancer on our reservation is high and it's directly um, related to these uranium um, mining that happened and these uh, radioactive spill that happened on our reservation. Um, so this topic, like I said, it really hits, it hits in the heart. Um, 
because you know I have family members who have suffered who have who have died from these illnesses um, related to radiation and it's it's horrible it's a, it's a loss of life it's a loss of safe water resources and um, a couple years ago my tribe banned uranium mining on the reservation um, so I guess my one of my questions is I, I was looking at the state water board and how um, that board is made up and I could see that there were seven members of this uh, water board, three of them Democrats, and three of them listed as Republican with one um, n no political affiliation listed. Um, is there a pattern that you see, doctor, in how the board um, approves or disapproves permits uh, applications when I don't know if it's ever been more Democrats and re, than Republicans on the board. Thank you. Well, the the board by uh, state law is split between Republicans and Democrats, so that that um, political party makeup is is pretty static. Um, what I notice when I look at that too is that the West River representation is limited. And it is uh, one person's from Oakoma, for example, right by Chamberlain. Um, you know, there really isn't much representation in our area and um, our area broadly speaking. And um, so that means that when these mining projects come up, we have people who have no stake in what happens making these decisions. And that I think is, is not how it should be. It ends up being uh, people who live here broadly again, uh, West River, um, asking this board made up of mostly people who are from areas that would not be affected to turn down permits and things like that. The uh, water management board has historically been friendly to most water permitting. So, um, you know, we're gonna have to work if we're gonna stop that and, and we need everybody to help particularly people who are East River. Dr. Jardine, uh, this is Dennis Holzer from Huron. Thank you very much for the excellent presentation and especially the history. Um, I think, you know, I, I, one thing I thought of are when you said something about the Rapid City people that, that are getting their water that would be affected, most of them people don't even realize even though it would, if there's a problem, it's, go, it's, gonna, it's going to, uh, change your, their water or, or make it dangerous. And I think, you know, the thing going all the way back in history, it's kind of, it's, it's a sad thing for the government um, in that whether it be the uranium, whether it be the gold, whether it be uh, pipelines that want, that want to cut across areas. Um, it seems to me like, unfortunately, there's so much big money in this type of thing and unfortunately, I think that's why things are slowed down. Administrations do make a difference. I'm I'm confident to say that there'll be rec more recognition of uh, against things like what the Forest Service and other people did, for example, under the previous administration that we just had. Um, I don't know. I think uh, I think getting information out is, but you know, information out is so important. But um, for the average person, you know, they go get their gas at the thing and they 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 get their different things they, they want to get, but uh, unless it affects them, and they, most people don't think it affects them. So when they see something out or something on the news about some people holding up signs or, or protests or something, they get labeled typically by the other side and and don't understand the ramifications. I don't know how you get people I real, you know, how do you get people to take this seriously? I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I, I mean, there's, I think there's so many people that that just take it for granted that everything's going to be safe, and and if they close the mine down, it isn't going to hurt. They, you know, they don't rec recognize that how you have to do all the cleanup. But how do how do you address? And I and you pointed out having your meetings and and doing the donations and different things like that, but how do you really get people's attention? I mean, 
just the oil pipeline that or the the, the uh, things that went on just in the last few years on that, you know, that made the news and stuff. But I mean, how do you really get people to recognize the significance of the dangers of this mining and different things that they're they're doing? And also, when I when I heard seen on there that they that the uh, federal agencies such as the Forest, Agent, Forest Service and others, uh, when you made fo uh, FOIA requests that they were got called, uh, got delayed and caught up in the bureaucracy. Uh, it, it is so disappointing because in my in my career, I was the head of HR for for a federal agency, and I and I and one of my duties was to, I was a FOIA officer, so I know all those rules and and how that works. And uh, let's just say I did just the opposite. I tried to get out as much as I could as quickly as I could. But anyway. How, what's the best way? Are people listening? Do you see do you see people that are starting to get it or are you just singing to the choir? Thank you. Uh, we're, we're seeing some of both. Um, when we took our resolution to the uh, Rapid City Council, for example, uh, there was a lot of information and people really knew what was going on. Part of the problem with the permitting processes is it's a long process um i run into people who haven't heard about uranium mining in a few years so they think either it's gone away or the mine's already started and that's why they're not hearing anything so i mean we're a small mostly volunteer organization so um you know we do as many things as we can but my experience is that there are a couple things that work well one is building alliances, which we definitely focus on doing. We try to build alliances with other organizations um, like Dakota Rural Action is one that we've worked with quite a bit. The Rapid Creek Watershed Action Group, we work with some. And then um, we work a lot with a number of different tribal officials. And um, so you need to have all different elements of society going at it. So. Um, that's one thing. And you want to do things that are newsworthy, but you can't do them every week because the media won't cover it. So um, we try to put the word out when things happen that are um, appear more important. Um, another thing is that these presentations, when we were in Colorado and I did a, 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 up to about um, 130 or so of these presentations to every group we could find. And that made a difference. And it wasn't, again, just me making the presentations. But when you saturate society and all the different networks in society with the information, it gets out there and things change. So that's why I say I really would like each of you to um, help out in terms of scheduling me for or someone from our group for your organization and I will tailor the presentation to your needs. So, um, you know, that's one thing. Someone asked for my um, contact information for other groups, and I'll put that in the chat right now and so that you have that information. Well, um, I, I see that the, the uh, Chante had to leave early for ceremony. Uh, so um, we're at our six o'clock hour now. And, uh, and before we go any further, uh, I'd like to uh, tell everybody that uh, thank you for your questions. I really appreciate your attendance here this evening. It's been a pleasure to see everybody on here. Um, Many of you I do know, and thank you for all the hard work that you're doing uh, for the state of South Dakota, your neighbors and your relatives. Um, it's, it's always a, a great, it's always great to see uh, Dr. Jarding again. Uh, uh, I, I consider Dr. Jarding an ally to the Lakota Oyate and, um, and more importantly for Unchi Maka, Mother Earth, Grandmother Earth. So, um, very, very appreciative of your work. Um, I'm just, I'm just trying to stall a little bit here to make sure everybody's get, had the opportunity to get on and, and look at the chat. Um, and um, before uh, I, I give you the, the final word, uh, Dr. Jarding, I will, 
uh, I will let everybody know that um, thank you for joining our progressive um, uh, weekly series. Next week on Tuesday, we have Tanisa Islam uh, uh, coming on to uh, to join us. To, and uh, it's going to be that one's going to be a really wonderful uh, uh, progressive meeting as well. And I look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, and um, I, I put my email in the chats too. So uh, uh, parting words, uh, Dr. Jarding, I, you have you have the um, the parting comments for everybody tonight. Oh, okay, I'm trying to get everyone's uh, email addresses off the chat also. So if we could save the chat, Remy, I don't know how to do that, but I know it can be done. Um, so that I get all this information, but um, I guess my final word is that. Uh, Wherever you live in South Dakota, this is an issue that impacts you. The, the wastes from both the gold and uranium mining go downriver to the Missouri River. And a lot of communities um, in both sides of the state get their water out of the Missouri River. The um, people who come to visit the Black Hills um, are helping out our local economy in a way that doesn't harm it like mining does. So the other thing I always suggest is that if you live somewhere else, come visit. Um, <laughs> we uh, are set up for visitors and, and like to see people. So um, I also would ask that if you can get on our website and, and check it over, and if you can donate something, we really, we really need donations always, and we have a lot coming up between both uranium and gold mining. So. Um, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the good questions. And I know I'll see some of you down the road because I know some of you, but I look forward to seeing some of you I don't know in the future as well. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to stay on here for just a couple of minutes while I uh, get all this uh, downloaded. Uh, but uh, again, thank you. Thank you everybody for showing up. And we look forward to seeing you uh, next week. <laughs>